Good morning. Good, morning. good morning. It's good to see all of you today as we're reading through the Word of God. We are in Luke chapter 2. We're going to finish it up. It's not a lot of verses today, but it's a real interesting story about Jesus in his young life. And basically from 12 to 30 years old, we don't have a lot of information about who Jesus is. There are a lot of myths who have been created, some of them rather demonic in nature, uh, but we're not going to talk about that. What we're going to talk about is the Word of God, that which we understand um, here in the book of Luke. But if you guys would pray with me. Father, we thank you that you're here this morning, that you've drawn us out, you've wakened us up, that we have health and strength and relative youth. I thank you, Lord, that you've gathered us here, and we're here to hear your word. We're here for your spirit to speak to our hearts. And Lord, you know that we need it. I myself need to be encouraged and strengthened and corrected and trained and reminded. And Lord, I imagine we all do. As we open up your word, Lord, I pray that your spirit would attend our hearts and our minds, that we wouldn't be distracted by anything outside this room or anything that might be troubling our hearts or our minds, but Lord, we would give you our undivided attention. So Lord, we give you this time and ourselves, in Jesus' name, amen. So if you've seen the screen, I've had a couple of questions of, did I really mean to put up a Where's Waldo thing? <laughs> Today, we're gonna talk about Where's Jesus? Because uh, any of you who have ever had a child and lost them at the mall will feel better today because Jesus' parents lose Jesus. And I can't imagine what that must have been like. But as we go through the story and as we look, it's going to be interesting. Um, it, I've I've been thinking and praying about this and looking through it, and I was like, well, it's only a few verses. I mean, these guys are going to get off with a 20-minute sermon, and they're out of here. So, But the more I looked, the more that I saw, and uh, I think there's a lot that we can learn. The highlight passage I have for this morning is something that Jesus said when he was finally found, and he said to them, his parents, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? but they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. I find it interesting that Jesus was the only child who was actually smarter than his parents, although all other children think they are. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. So just in case you forget where you are, we're just going to read through the passage. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. And he went down with them, and he came to Nazareth, and he was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. 
So we have this little look, and the book of Luke is the only one that records this because Luke is going around taking stories. He's probably sitting down with Mary and getting the backstory as he did the birth of, of Jesus and as he did the birth of John the Baptist. So he's gathering all this information, and we have this little glimpse into this one thing that Mary remembers, and I bet she remembers it very vividly. Three days lost. Three days. I don't know if you've ever lost a child and had your name over the loudspeaker in the mall. <laughs> Would so-and-so come pick up their child at the lost and found? How many of you had an experience like that? Okay, some of you probably had more of an experience like, would you please come and pick up your child from school? They're expelled. <laughs> I thought so. Welcome to New Jersey. So, imagine losing a 12-year-old child in a gigantic crowd. We're talking of hundreds of thousands of people that would gather for the feast, and Jesus is missing. And you, th I don't know about you, but at first reading, I go, what kind of parents did God give the Messiah to after all? I mean, they lose Jesus and they're just traveling home. We're talking like 80 miles, and you didn't check to see if your, own, your, your firstborn is with you? And I, I hear stories about people forgetting about their children, but, you know, this is it's kind of important. I mean, he was given a name by an angel in advance. She was a virgin. There's a lot of circumstances here, and you'd think you'd pay a little more careful attention to the Messiah, the Savior of the world, than just traveling on and forgetting him at a gigantic festival. At least my judgmental mind goes there on first reading. <laughs> it says, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So Jesus didn't stay a little baby in a manger. He eventually grew up as a young child, and he went through all of the same pains and difficulties and hardships that you and I go through. He was the son of God. He was God the son, and yet he was a human being who went through everything that you and I go through. He went through teething. He went through uh, being bullied at school. In fact, there are some writings about Jesus' intermediary life that say that Jesus went to school and when being taught with the Aleph and the B and going through the alphabet, the teacher uh, said, okay, this is A, repeat after me, say A. He said A. And then she said, okay, and this is B, say B. He goes, well, I won't, I won't say B until you explain the A. And it says the teacher raised her hand to, to hit him. And Jesus looked at her hand and her hand withered up and it never worked again. Like I said, some of these stories are just demonic. <laughs> Jesus was in school and he was boasting about how he was the son of God and he could do anything he wants. <clears throat> and of course that goes over well with your friends. And he said, you see the birds in the air, they're, they're actually singing because I make them sing. And they said, no, that's not true. And Jesus looked at a bird and it fell to the ground dead. There's another one where there was a little child who was making fun of him because he was, uh, there was questionable birth because his mother was a teenage pregnancy without being married. And he was getting flack for that. And he looked at this kid and the kid dropped dead. So there's people that write all kinds of garbage. I just thought I'd warn you about it. Um, so I could do the research so you don't have to. But this is true and this is real. Jesus grew up and we know that he was 12 years old. And of course he went through all of the things like you and I have to go through. And I'm sure Mary was careful to protect him and watch over him. A special understanding of who he was and his calling. And of course you always want to look over your kids. You always think yours are the best. Wow, I thought for sure you'd agree with me. Um, <laughs> You know that he was the carpenter's son, and in that time you picked up whatever it is that your dad did, that's what you did, and so you learned that stuff from your father. Uh, my son didn't pick up things that I did very well. Um, I, was, I was an installer and a, and a carpentry kind of guy, and he had absolutely no interest in it, and that's good because he doesn't need it right now. So 
But J Jesus learned from Joseph, and he had to teach him how to work with wood. I always wondered, did Jesus ever have to make a cross? This is what I do all week when I'm thinking. <laughs> so Jesus is making things, and he's growing up, and he's learning that God came into the body of a human being supernaturally and grew up just like you and I. And he had to learn to speak. He had to learn to read. He had to read the scriptures. He had to gain understanding. He had to be filled with wisdom. Everything that you and I go through, Jesus knows, because he did it from scratch, literally. Amen? Yes. And that's why he's a worthy savior, Amen. because he's been through everything we have, and yet without sin. Now, that's the kind of kid I would like to have. What about you? one of those. And so Jesus had to learn to pray. He had to learn to read the scriptures. He had to learn all of these things as a child. And I wonder, because there was a prophecy given to Mary, I wonder if she saw foreshadows of what would happen to Jesus. Because remember, she was told, we looked at it last week, in the temple, there was Anna and Simeon, and Simeon said, oh yes, and a sword will strike your heart as well, pierce your heart as well, speaking of his death. And I wonder if she didn't understand that, and then, you know, over her shoulder, see little foreshadowings of it as Jesus was growing up. It says in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus had to learn obedience because that was something before him being incarnate, he never had to do. His nature and everything about him was just to be God and to be in control and to call the shots. Here he had to learn to be obedient to faulty parenting, <laughs> to a sick, crazy world. He had to learn how to deal with these things, not authoritarianly, but in submitting when he didn't want to. So when we talk about, you know, picking up your cross and carrying it, like Jesus said, he knows what he's talking about because he submitted himself and being found perfect he became eligible to be our savior because he was Jesus Christ. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover. So I don't know if you can appreciate what it is to have a road trip of about 80 miles. Maybe having a donkey, maybe not. And at this point, we know that Joseph and Mary had other children. And so it's not just Jesus that's in the picture. You've got at least two brothers and you've got at least two sisters that come along at this point. So you're talking about the whole family. I don't know any of you with kids and you have to get out the door. You know, you can only go as fast as the weakest link. I know what that's like. If you're married. Okay, you know that one. Okay. You can only go as fast as the slowest person. If you're in a caravan of cars, you can only go as fast as the slowest person. It's just the nature of things. And so you can imagine all the preparation and getting ready. And they're going to Jerusalem, which is about a three-day trip. And they're going to be coming back, which is a three-day trip. And they're going to be spending eight days there. This is, this is quite a road trip, kind of a vacation, uh, kind of camping out. Because you go so far, and then you just say, we're done. And you plant, you make a tent, you camp out, you grab something to eat, you go to sleep, the sun begins to get up, you pack up all your stuff, you throw it on the donkey, and off you go. You and all, and all your stuff and all your kids. You, you guys ever do that, like camping in that way? You want a vacation after that. <laughs> so this is what they're doing. It's this family camping trip, and it says that the family would go every year. And of course, there are all of these songs of ascent where as they're approaching uh, the city, they were to sing and they're beautiful. And I, I would have put them all up here, but it would have taken till Tuesday. 
But you can imagine the excitement as they're coming near Jerusalem and they're there for the Passover, which is uh, celebrating their deliverance from slavery, uh, which we do when we take communion, by the way. We celebrate our release from slavery to sin. And so there's this wonderful camping trip. It's kind of like Woodstock, except Jesus is the center instead of, you know, Jimi Hendrix, you know, or Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, or any of, the, any of you remember Woodstock? I don't know. So it's like Woodstock, but it's, but it's based on, you know, serving God, okay? His parents went to Jerusalem every year. Now, they didn't have to go. Mary didn't have to go. The children didn't have to go. Every male had to go. It was one of the three mandatory feasts. Anyone within a 50-mile radius was required to go. It's here in Deuteronomy 16, verses 16 and 17. And so you can imagine how many hundreds of thousands of people filled this city area, and they would go into the city during the day, and then at night they would go outside the walls and they would camp. They would find places to be uh, within the city of Jerusalem. So it's a, it's a wild time. Jesus looks and learns from Joseph. Joseph takes his whole family. He doesn't just go by himself. Everybody goes. And so he, he takes everyone. That's pretty cool. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when you get time away from your family, it's kind of nice. But he chose to bring his entire family. And I think that shows something of, of the tightness of their family. By the way, this is what Passover looks like presently when everyone gathers just at the one wall, at the western wall there in Jerusalem. And uh, it's a wild time, but also you don't want to go during Ramadan either because that's also a very packed time uh, if you're going to be going to the holy city. It says, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. You see, Jesus, right around 12 to 13 years old in the Jewish faith, they have what's called a bar mitzvah. You know what a bar mitzvah is? Bar meaning son and mitzvah meaning law or covenant. So you're a son of the covenant. It basically is an induction into manhood for a young man. That we recognize you as now taking uh, charge of your own life, making choices for yourself. Um, it, it's it's kind of what happens when you get your driver's license today or when you graduate from high school and your parents say, bye. <laughs> but 12 years old, you're now responsible, like an adult, which is partly why Jesus is going. And it's partly some of the confusion that goes on here, which is why Mary said, I thought he was with you. And he said, I thought he was with you. Because he's 12 years old. He's right on this tipping point of going from child to manhood. And if you're a man, you hang with the men. If you're a child, you hang with the women. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I, I hang with a woman because I married her. But so Jesus is going into Jerusalem for the festival, and they do this every single year. So they gather with the people of God, and they observe the law of God so that they might learn. Verse 43, and when they had finished the days, by the way, that's an eight-day week. It's one day for Passover and then seven days of unleavened bread. So they stick around, so it's an eight-day feast. They returned, and the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. This is why I know scripture wasn't written by man, because nobody would put that there if they were the author. Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, by the way, that's not like Amazon, that's in, in, the, in the group of people that they were with. They went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So this is typically how they would do it. They would all go together, all, everybody from Nazareth, you know, you work out a carpool situation and everybody's kind of going together and everybody in mass goes and plants because there's safety in numbers. And if you're going to be camping in numbers, you know, there are people out there that might mean you harm. There are animals out there in that area that would mean you harm. And the more people that you have, and specifically more of the men that, you know, camp around the outside, keep watch, the safer you are as a group, as a company. And that's the, the word they're using here. And so as they were leaving and packing up, pulling up tent stakes and on their way out, the group begins to go. Usually the men go first. 
And so they go, uh, I'm sorry, the women go first because the women and the children, sometimes with animals, they'll go a bit slower. And so they'll actually go first and the guys get to stand around and talk a little while. And then they end up following up behind. And so they get a day's journey away to a meeting point, which is about eight miles away. And they're wondering, where's Jesus? Well, he stayed back in Jerusalem. My question is, if parents are separated from a kid, whose fault is that? I feel like singing the Oompa Loompa song. <laughs> the mother and the father. Sorry. <laughs> but it also tells you some of the character of Jesus because they didn't worry about him. He wasn't a kid that would be running off, setting fires, or, you know, I'd be playing with gasoline, or, you know, I'd be doing crazy things. So my parents were always wondering where I was. But they didn't worry about where Jesus was, because he always was where he was supposed to be. But they just assumed that he was playing with the other kids, because sometimes they would have play dates, you know, and parents would be watching your kid, while, or sometimes you watch their kid, and all of that's going on during the festival. And so it's a natural thing that they would assume, Mary would assume, he, he must be with his father, because he's bar mitzvah now and he's a man, so he's gonna hang with the men and talk about men things. And then he's saying, well, you know, he's only 12. He's probably with mom like he's always been, but that's not the case. And so they ask around and you can imagine after a day's journey, getting eight miles away and discovering you left Jesus. And so they ask around, and I don't know if any of you are, are anxious sort of mothers. Mm -hmm. I notice that mothers tend to worry more than fathers. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just my own experience, but you know, my kids are missing. It's like, that's all right, they'll come back. <laughs> they'll get hungry. <laughs> yeah, but we don't know where they are. We don't know what they're doing. And they, anything could be happening. Whoa, whoa. You see, God put that in a woman to protect the child because children would do the craziest things. And he'll put into your mind all of the possibilities that could possibly be happening so that you might make sure it doesn't happen. But you know, you can carry that on your own shoulders as a load and you can worry about it and you can become a worrier, which is not what you're supposed to do. On the other hand, I can become completely callous and not care where they are. I haven't seen them for three days. Where are they? And when they had finished the days, they returned. And this is the place, by the way, where they believe that it, it happened. They built a church on top of this location um, around 1100 AD, commemorating what they believed was where they stopped. And it's right between Jerusalem and Nazareth where they were heading home. So this is right where they believe it happened. And of course, they've built a whole bunch of things around it. And they've taken much of the stones down and built bridges with it nearby. And uh, they've desecrated this entire place. But it is a place that's here. And just to show you, I, I cut and pasted all of that information right here. The place is called Albira. So Albira is, is not far from Ramallah. So if you, if you want to uh, check it out, you can. But this is actually a location, and they have it kind of cordoned off now, and they're not taking any more of those stones. I mean, this is an ancient, ancient church. And you can see where the front of the church was right here, right here in the, in the front center. That's where this place was. And it was there to commemorate the place where <laughs> Joseph and Mary met up and discovered Jesus isn't here. I don't know about you, I, want, I don't want anybody making a monument to my forgetfulness <laughs> of, you know, leaving Jesus. Uh, so, you know, don't do that. Oh, this is, this is the very place where, uh, you know, my, my son kicked me and knocked me to my knees. You know, I don't know, I, I can't think of setting up anything for that. And so when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. And so this is a day's journey out. They've gone a day's journey out, and now it's nighttime. So they plan, and they look for Jesus. Jesus is nowhere, and they're like, okay, that's it. One night passes without your boy. Morning comes, you pack up, and you're going right back to where you came from. That must have been the longest journey ever. Because I don't know, those of you who are married understand what it's like. I thought he was with you. Well, I thought he was with you. Well, he... He is bar mitzvah, he is. Yeah, but he's still a child. 
I, could, I, I mean, I could see the conversation all the way for eight miles with the family, dragging the kids, come on, come on, where are we going, Why? are we there yet? You know, you get all that. It must have been the longest day, like, very memorable. This is why Mary remembers it. And so now that it was after three days, they found him in the temple. See, they went a day's journey out. They came a day's journey back, probably looked around before it got dark. And then the next day, they're looking for Jesus. Three days. I don't know about you, whenever I see three days, a little, little antenna comes up in the back of my head because it was on the third day that Jesus rose. Remember that? It was on the third day that Abraham brought his son and he had to sacrifice his son. It was a three-day journey. Anyway, I always think when I see three days. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. As a parent, you're freaking out. The Savior's gone. We left him, and suddenly you find him, and he's very relaxed. He's having a blast. He's with the teachers of the law. He's with the sophisticated, the doctors, the multiple doctor degrees guys, and he's talking about the scriptures. He's not just asking them questions, but they're asking him questions, and he's responding, and they're amazed that this 12-year-old, where, where do you get all this wisdom? Where do you get all this knowledge? As a parent, walking up on a child who's having a great time being free from mom and dad, I would be a little ticked. Oh, so you're having a good time, are you? You know, you get that neck thing when you're, when you're mad. I don't know, some of you do. I've seen it. So he's talking with them. And he's listening to them, and he's asking them questions as they find him. And these guys are amused at this 12-yard, this freshly bar mitzvahed boy, giving them information and responding to them with wisdom like never before. It's the third day, guys, when Jesus shows up, you know. He's setting a precedent here for the third day. Just thought I'd let you know. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers, which means not only was he listening and asking questions, but they were asking questions of him and he was giving them answers. How many of you parents would be willing to take instruction from a 12 year old? And Jesus is here with the creme de la creme, the Sadducees, these real, real uh, intelligent men, and he's having an intelligent conversation with them like he's one of them. I got a question. How much divine wisdom was possessed and how much was learned? How much did Jesus know when he was 12 years old, just divinely inspired, led of the Spirit? And how much did he have to learn, just like you and I? Did he have to memorize the scriptures, the very scriptures that he was behind pre-incarnate? You know, I just assumed Jesus knew everything. He just knew everything even at 12 years old. Well, that, that wasn't the case. He had to learn and he had to suffer. And I just find how much of it had to be learned, just like you and I. I don't know about you, but my brain is not so sharp. I forget things. I use words like thing all the time. <laughs> you know that thing, the thing, the guy with the thing. Instead of using a name and an, and an object name. You know, the, the, the guy with the thing that went to the place, you know, over there a couple of days ago. You know, general terms, because you, you forget things. How much did Jesus have to work to remember? Or was he just suddenly born with a photographic memory? I think it's a combination of both. And I think with us, it's a combination of both, isn't it? How many scriptures do you have memorized? Is that a result of the Spirit's work? Well, sure. Is it a result of your labor? Oh, sure it is. Try to memorize a scripture without reading it. <laughs> you want to see if you're involved at all? Try that. Try getting what you ask for without asking. That's, that's another good one, too. 
So Jesus is this combination of spiritually inspired from birth, and yet he had to learn, and he had to submit himself. But he also knew some things that they didn't, and they were amazed and astonished that Jesus is teaching. I can only say that his father probably opened the scriptures to him and taught him. Men, that's an important thing for your kids, is that they know the scriptures. Because if they don't, this world will swallow them whole. I wonder who was there. Think about all of the people when Jesus goes back a second time as an adult. He goes every year. And from here on, he's going every year. Imagine who was there. I wonder if Camellia was there. I wonder if Saul of Tarsus was there. I wonder if Nicodemus was there. I wonder if Joseph of Arimathea was there. These are all folks that would be on this council. These are all folks that were involved in the temple. I wonder if they were there. And I wonder if they remembered him when he came back, when he was 30 years old and entered into ministry, and he started clearing the temple. I'm not sure that was his first introduction. I think this was. And when they saw him, they were amazed. His parents were amazed to find him in the temple, teaching and listening and answering. And he's got a captive audience. And now mom's got to go up and break this thing up. You know what it's like when your kid's involved in something and, and you as a parent have to go up and they're always embarrassed. Are, my kids were, I, I, maybe yours aren't. You know, you go up and you say hi, maybe you want to give them a hug, and they're like, Dad? <laughs> well, you guys never had that problem. It was just me. Okay. No, but now they have to break this up, and they've got to get Jesus away from all of this because it's been three days. And by the way, he took care of himself for three days. He didn't have a problem. He wasn't upset. He didn't throw any accusations at his parents. Oh! <gasps> You left me, you know, and put the guilt on him. I mean, I, I might have as a kid just for fun, but. And Jesus comes back 30 years later and does this. Standing in the temple right where they found him, still doing ministry 30 years later, uh, when he's 30 years old. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Now, you guys have read this story before. Did you ever watch my big fat Greek wedding? Oh, yeah. The young lady says that she's, you know, she's growing up now. She doesn't want to work in the family diner. And, you know, she wants to go and uh, learn to do uh, something else, you know. Um, and... Yeah, to be a travel agent. And her father looks at her and goes, why you do this to me? <laughs> As though she were doing something specifically against him. Like his, his world was just all about him. You see, he wasn't interested in his daughter doing something she wanted to do. It was just all about him. Why you do this to me? That's kind of what Mary said. Why, son, did you do this to us? We have been beside ourselves. We've been anxiously searching for you. It's interesting, the wording. Your father and I. There's so many things wrong with the sentence. Number one, Jesus didn't do anything to them. They left. But her accusation is, why did you do this to us? It seems like a blame shift thing. I don't know. I, maybe I'm getting too deep into it psychologically. But why did you do this to us? Look, your father and I. Oh, by the way, he's not my father. I can see Jesus in the next sentence correcting her. <laughs> by the way, it's not my father. Come on, let's get the heck out of here. You know, let's go, let's go, let's go. We've been looking anxiously for you. Why did you do this to us? You know, we love to blame other people for our fears. And we just do that automatically. 
I can't believe what you did to me. You make me feel like a piece of garbage. By the way, no one makes you feel like a piece of garbage. You feel like a piece of garbage when you feel like a piece of garbage. When you choose to feel like a piece of garbage, when you give heed to words that probably you shouldn't give heed to. When you listen and believe things you probably shouldn't listen to and believe. It's the quietest it's ever been in here. <laughs> Take responsibility for your own feelings. And don't blame other people for how you feel. Scripture says in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's the spirit of God, not the spirit of fear. Fear usually comes because there's some kind of a guilt. There's some kind of a guilt that we need to take care of, but there's a wonderful process to deal with that. We confess, we apologize, we ask for forgiveness, we offer repentance. The blood of Jesus Christ washes us of all sins. And that's how we deal with it, right? Just, just pretend you're, you're agreeing with me. And he said to them, why did you seek me? A better rendered, why did you look everywhere for me? You didn't need to look everywhere for me. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? You see, she said, you're, me and your father have been anxiously searching for you. Well, I've been about my father's business. And he wasn't talking about carpentry. He wasn't trying to work up some contracts with people in Jerusalem. He was talking about his heavenly father. You see how Jesus responds and corrects her speech in the most gracious of ways. I've been about my father's business, and you should have known that. Especially you, Mary. I mean, what do you need, another angel? <laughs> but they did not understand the statement in which he spoke. Jesus was living his life in purpose. He didn't sit there for three days chewing his nails, crying in a corner. He got busy. He realized he was here for a purpose. Amen. And he says, if I'm here in Jerusalem, apparently God the Father needs me here. So let me get about his business. Let me get about what God wants me to do. You know, sometimes we think we're stuck in a situation. We think we're trapped in a relationship. We think that we're in a place that we shouldn't be, and we just wanted to go away and pray that God takes it away. And yet you miss the purpose of why God allowed you to get there. There's a book called Don't Waste Your Cancer. The author had cancer and had to go through all these treatments and everything. And the author says, don't waste your cancer. If you have cancer, if there's something going on, then why did God allow that to happen? If he allowed it to happen, he has a purpose in it. But if you get so focused on yourself, you'll never see past the end of your own nose. And you can get so tied up with your own needs and your own feelings and your own wants and your own desires and all of that that you forget about the Lord and that he's sovereign, by the way. I just saw that there was a recent shooting down in Texas, another shooting. I just read this week that there was a woman who forgot her baby in the car for an hour and a half and the baby died of heat exhaustion. I've, I get these things on my phone every day and that's exactly what happens to my heart. It dies. And I think, why? Why? Well, I know why. God created us perfect. He created us in his image. We decided to step off and do our own thing. And we stepped into sin. And our forefathers have passed it down to us. And genetically, we're all messed up with sin. But God made a way by sending his own son for us. So that through his death and through his sacrifice and his resurrection, we don't have to die forever. Don't you understand? I have to be about my father's business. By the way, this is the last that we hear of Joseph. This is the last remark about Joseph. And we see, uh, usually, you, you read through the scriptures and Joseph falls off very early. But we know that there are a number, number of brothers naturally born to both Joseph and Mary. And Jesus grows up in a single parent family. So any of you who are a single parent, Jesus understands. 
It says in John 6, 28 and 29, and they said to him, what shall we do that we may do the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to him, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. So I wonder what business it was that Jesus had in the temple. I had an idea that it might be about disclosing who he was. That he might be explaining to them passages in Isaiah where the Messiah would come and the, the root out of dry ground and all of these things concerning himself, much like he did on the road to, uh, to Emmaus when he explained to the disciples who he was. I wonder if Jesus wasn't about the business of educating and prepping these guys in the temple for his unveiling. I think he was about the business of the Father. You know, if we're going to be about the business of the Father, it's about revealing who Jesus is. Amen? Yes. And they went down with them, and they came to Nazareth, and he was subject to them. By the way, that means he submitted to them. All of you young people, he submitted to his parents. This is God the Son, submitted to his earthly parents. But his mother kept all these things in her heart because she remembered them enough to be able to tell Luke. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I can imagine Jesus growing up and Mary and Joseph watching him grow up and Mary watching Joseph interact with her son, knowing it wasn't his. That can be a very difficult hurdle to get over. And yet know that God gave him to you as a charge to watch over to be a father too. So if you've ever been adopted, Jesus understands that too. I doubt Jesus was a rebel in his youth. I don't think he ran with a bad crowd as he was growing up. I don't see him with, you know, walking with his pants at half mast put a boom box down the street. <laughs> but he grew up like you and I did with all the same difficulties and yet he was without sin, which is why he's my hero. And so, don't forget Jesus. If Mary and Joseph forget, could forget about Jesus, you can forget about Jesus. Have you ever forgotten about Jesus? It is a daily conscious commitment that I have to remember his presence, that he's here with us right this very minute, that he knows every thought in our mind, he knows every intention of our heart, he knows the future, he knows the past. He knows all of it, and he loves you anyway. Don't forget Jesus. This is Sunday, and you've all made time to be here, and that's wonderful, and I appreciate that. But don't leave Jesus here and come back and find him a week from now. You need to take Jesus with you. Just like Mary and Joseph should have. You don't wait until you're a day away and then look for Jesus. Because we do that, don't we? We kind of go about our lives and we segment things, especially we as men. We kind of parcel things out into little compartments. And, you know, this is my church life and this is my business life and this is my home life. Don't leave Jesus out of any of those circles. It's easy to do. A couple of verses to close. In Isaiah 45, 20, it says, Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you who have escaped from the nations, by the way, the world. They have no knowledge, who carry the wood of their carved image, and they pray to a God that cannot save. The scripture asks us to gather together, exactly like we're doing right here. Come together. I mean, we've had all sorts of obstacles in being able to do that. But while you can, gather together. And I have to say, it's exciting to see some fresh faces here today. The scripture tells us to gather together, you who have escaped from the nations. In Ecclesiastes 5.1, it says, walk prudently when you come to the house of God and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they do evil. When I come to this place, when I come to this place, I come to speak. 
When I step down from this place, I want to listen. I want to know how you're doing. I want to know what's going on in your life. I want to know what's happening between you and your relationship with Jesus. I hope when you come here, you want to know just as eagerly what's going on in my life. I had young Wendy in the back ask me today, how are you doing, Pastor Dave? And she really meant it. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. The rest of you I'm mad at. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> To reach in and to want to be connected to other people is what God's designed us for. He's never designed us to live alone. And you can lose Jesus by losing his representative and not having somebody to link arms with. It says in James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You know why Jesus was left behind? Because they walked away from him. Notice the obligation is upon us First, draw near to God, and in response, he will draw near to you. We have something to do with that. If you feel like God's far away, who moved? Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And quite often, that's what causes us to draw away from the Lord is our sin in our life our guilt, the things that we've done that we just can't seem to let go of or reconcile before him. And the scripture encourages us to lay it down. If you've got things in your life that are causing you to be away from the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you guys and charge you and challenge you, lay it down today. Lay it down. Because if he keeps you from fellowship with God and he keeps you from fellowship with others, whatever it is, I know it's not anywhere near worth it. Amen? It says in Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, to the seven churches that Jesus wrote to, he says this to Ephesus, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Jesus is telling the church at Ephesus, you, you've done a lot of good things, and he tells them previously, they, you've done some good things, but this one thing I have against you, you left your first love, your heart is not in it anymore. You're going through the motions. You've left the heart of Jesus. And it can happen to you and me if we don't draw near and if we don't repent it says, remember the height from which you have fallen. In fact, this is a good counseling point for couples that aren't getting along well. I'll, I'll usually ask them, so when did you guys meet and how did you meet? And two people who are angry at each other, pointing fingers at each other, suddenly will start to grin and smile and tell me the story of how they met and how they fell in love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Remember how, the good times where you came from when you were doing well with the Lord. Remember that time and get back there. Because Jesus is always in the last place you left him. Jesus is always in the last place you left him. Much like your car keys. I want you guys to pray with me as the worship team comes up. Lord, you know our hearts. You know our needs. You know our tendency to wander. And Lord, if it's possible for Joseph and Mary to leave you, I know it's possible for us. And we've done it. Lord Jesus, I pray that you might revitalize our hearts and our relationship with you, that your spirit might fall upon us today, that you would draw us into a deep, intimate relationship with you once again. We don't want to turn around and wonder what what if we gave it all? Lord, none of us wants to wake up to a wasted life. I pray that you might fill us with the knowledge of your presence. That you would make us totally and completely yours today. 
If there are things, Lord, we've been holding on to which have caused us to walk away from you, I pray that you'd help us to release them into your care, that you'd remove them from our lives, that you would give us the ability to repent, the strength to say no to those things that would draw us elsewhere. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit that works in our heart. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice on the cross, how it has set us free to live for you. Pray that your name be lifted up today in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.